winch to safety from a terrifying nightmare at sea. More than 100 migrants and refugees were plucked from the Mediterranean. But just look at how many were on board the boat that sank. Perhaps 700. There are barely any life jackets and out of sight, women and children trapped below in the ship's hold. What chance did they have? For so many, the journey was their last. Dozens of bodies had been recovered. Hundreds are still missing in what is one of the deadliest tragedies along the dangerous crossing to Europe. Qasem Abouzaid said his wife paid four and a half thousand dollars to be on that boat. He hasn't heard from her. We didn't get approval for my wife's asylum application to Germany, where I work. The application got delayed and we didn't get approval. Greek authorities say they first made contact with the boat around 2 p.m. on Tuesday, but it didn't ask for help. At 6 p.m. and again at 9 p.m., commercial ships reached the boat and provided food and water, but those on board reportedly said they wanted to continue towards Italy. Around 11 p.m., the Greek Coast Guard approached it from a distance and said the boat had a steady course and speed. By 2 a.m., though, the boat was seen capsizing and quickly sinking. And migrant charity Alarm Phone say they received multiple calls beginning just after 2 p.m. requesting help, saying those on board were in distress, the boat was overcrowded, no longer moving, and the captain had abandoned them. Some have questioned why the Greek Coast Guard didn't do more when the boat appeared so obviously dangerous. Greek officials say they couldn't do more because those on board didn't want them to. But they've been criticised for how they treat migrants before. In this footage, published by the New York Times, they march a number of migrants onto a small boat, then abandon them at sea, leaving it to Turkey to come and rescue them. Ten days out from an election, Greece's opposition leader Alexis Tsipras called out Europe's attitude to migration. I want to say that there are huge responsibilities, huge political responsibilities with the migration policy that Europe has been following for years, a migration policy that turns the Mediterranean, our seas, into watery graves. And I think it is time to speak the truth, because this policy has to change. With the number of crossings rising, there have been similar scenes in Italy in recent months too. And they're likely be more this summer. Three days of national mourning have been declared here in Greece, but the man who's led the government here for the past four years and who looks set to be re-elected soon has actually in the past trumpeted his tough approach on migration, calling it firm but fair, and it's proved pretty popular with voters. But activists say the hardline tactics have led migrants to take to even riskier routes when trying to, to, to reach Europe. Uh, both uh, Greece and Italy find themselves once again on the front lines of a migration crisis, just as they have in the past. Uh, the EU is trying to work out a, a new deal that would change the way asylum seekers are relocated around the continent, that would make it easier to deport some of them back to countries they've travelled through. But this boat set off from Libya. Thousands of other migrants and refugees are still in North Africa waiting to make this journey across the Mediterranean this tragedy is not going to put them off. Thank you, Sekunda, in Athens. And to Tunisia now, as we heard earlier, for so many of those setting off on these perilous journeys, the departure point is the northern coast of Africa. And our foreign affairs correspondent, Porik O'Brien, is in Tunis now for us. Porik. Kieran, this is first and foremost a terrible tragedy, of course, but important context as well as SEC was alluding to there. On the central Mediterranean route, so that's people transiting through Tunisia and Libya to try to get to Italy, there has been a 300 increase in the numbers of people tr trying it that way this year compared to last year. 50,000 migrants and refugees made it to Italy this year. Now, is that a crisis? 
politicians in Greece, Italy and indeed the United Kingdom are certainly framing it in that way. So what are they doing about it? They're doing two things, deterring people, trying to create an environment so hostile in those countries that people won't want to go there. Now that is not working. The second thing they're trying to do is they're pumping millions of euros and sterling into the governments of Tunisia and Libya, into their coast guards to try to turn back these boats as they leave the coasts. What is the upshot of that? We've been talking to officials here at the Tunisian Coast Guard and they're telling us that they're seeing an enormous spike in the level of violence directed at the Coast Guard by would-be migrants and refugees trying to get to Italy. The other upshot of this is the cost of the smuggling packages. If you take this boat that went down off the coast of Italy, an estimated 700 people on board, there are reports from survivors that they paid up to 5,000 euros a head. Now that is 3.5 million euros of profits for the people smugglers. Over the coming days, we'll be out at sea, hopefully with the Tunisian Coast Guard, to show you what this policy actually looks like on the front line. Porik, thank you very much indeed. Well, back in Greece, survivors of the shipwreck are now receiving medical treatment. I'm joined by Georgos Vasilakos, a doctor volunteering with the Hellenic Red Cross, and he spent the day helping survivors as they came ashore. Um, Dr Vasilakos, you must have been helping people in real, real distress today. Good afternoon. Uh, yes, today was a really busy day. Uh, we were mobilized yesterday evening and we were one of the first medical teams to arrive on the scene uh, after the, this uh, tragic shipwreck. Uh, at first, uh, the Hellenic Red Cross provided um, the urgent needs of the survivors like uh, food and clothing. Um, and of course, some first aid. Uh, however, uh, after the first day, we it became clear that medical assistance was uh, was needed on site. So we were mobilized from Patras, which is our headquarters, and uh, we arrived in Kalamatas in Kalamata uh, port on the, um, on the let's say this uh, field reception center, um, which houses. Uh, until now, about 75 uh, victims. And you, uh, and you were given and the we, medical treatment yourself. And what did they tell you, the survivors of this shipwreck, about what had happened? Well, uh, we were mainly focused on treating them. Uh, however, we, you could see the, the suffering in their eyes. Uh, they, they, their urge to find the, the the necessities uh, for the next day because they like don't know what tomorrow lies ahead. Um, um, and those people we, there that you were, that you were that you were supporting, they, presumably they were wondering where their family and friends were. Uh, of course, uh, the, there are several several um, departments of the Red Cross, of the Hellenic Red Cross, and the IFRC uh, on site trying to restore family links and identify the survivors and, of course, uh, have information about the, the lost ones. And what do you know about reports that women and children were trapped below deck? Yes, this uh, seems to be the case. Uh, all survivors are men aged between uh, 15 to 42 years old of age. Uh, no women or children have have uh, been found uh, alive until now. Um, it seems that they were below deck, and because of the of the force of the water getting in uh, and the um, and the ra rapid uh, unfolding of events, uh, I don't think that the forecast is really good uh, on finding survivors. Jorgos Vasilakos, thank you very much indeed.